These are five examples to develop your intuition around protein expression vectors based on the information you already have. Example 1 is so common that you don't even think about it. The ampicillin resistance gene in the plasmid backbone. It has all the major components for protein expression. A promoter, a ribosome binding site, an ORF with a defined start and stop codon. The promoter is compatible only with the bacterial RNA polymerase, and the ribosome binding site as well. The final outcome is a functional protein that provides resistance against ampicillin. Let's go a step further. Typically, the translated protein is transported out of the cell. For this to happen, it must have a signal sequence to relocate the protein. The signal sequence is cleaved off in the periplasm before the protein is kicked out of the cell, out in the wilderness to destroy ampicillin. In case of this protein, the signal sequence is at the N-terminal end, preceding the coding sequence for the final functioning enzyme. The protein that comes out is called beta-lactamase, and that is the structure of the simplest kind of protein expression vector. Just to be explicit, the mRNA is made starting from the TSS till the termination point. The protein is made using a sub-portion of the mRNA. Here is an annotated snapshot of the AMP resistance from PUC19. There is the AMP promoter, a ribosome binding site, and an ORF following that, which begins with the secretion signal going into beta-lactamase, and it ends with the stop codon and a transcription terminator. Example 2 is a step up. Now you want to express a green fluorescent protein in bacteria. The template for GFP comes from jellyfish. The vector structure for expressing GFP looks something like this. Now, how would you get the coding sequence for GFP? We discussed this in the last video. You take the mRNA from jellyfish, convert it into cDNA, maybe add some restriction enzymes to the primers to clone this insert into the vector. This type of construct keeps the GFP cytosolic. If you want GFP to go to a specific location, you need to add a localization sequence to the GFP. For a lot of protein expression vectors like PETs, GEMS, or JEX series, or any expression vectors, you typically don't have to worry about promoters and terminators. You just use the internal sites to clone your insert in front of the promoter. For vectors like PET, the promoter is typically a viral T7 promoter, which is incompatible with bacterial RNA polymerase. For those vectors, you use an engineered bacteria like DE3, which expresses T7 RNA polymerase. In our construct, the GFP expression will probably work, but the translation could be inefficient. The GFP comes from jellyfish, which are evolutionarily distant from bacteria and do not have the same codon usage, so the GFP has to be codon optimized. Here is one example of GFP expression architecture in bacteria using the LAC promoter. Let's revisit the human insulin example from the previous video. Insulin is a tricky little protein. The insulin protein resulting from the translation has multiple parts. A signal peptide, a B chain, a C chain, and an A chain. After some processing and maturation, the signal peptide and the C chain is removed from this immature insulin to make the final product. The final functional insulin only has A and B chains, chained by three disulfide bonds. Now, let's go back to the expression vector. Going with the same logic as before, if you wanted the insulin template for your protein expression vector, you would take the RNA, make cDNA from it, and clone that product between the promoter and the terminator, and you might also codon optimize the ORF to make the protein synthesis efficient. The product of this ORF will be cytosolic. The immature insulin has a signal peptide for translocation to endoplasmic reticulum where disulfide bonds are made. To make disulfide bonds in bacteria, you want this protein to end up in the periplasmic space. So you add a signal to the ORF. The final protein from this will have three chains, the human signal peptide, and the periplasmic signal. Unfortunately, this insulin protein is going to be non-functional. Well, why is that? You can argue that the periplasm correctly makes the disulfide bonds. So what is wrong with this protein? It is the post-translational modifications. The mature insulin undergoes proteolytic processing, whereby the signal peptide and the C-chain is removed. Enzymes that we have do this processing. These enzymes are not found in bacteria, so we cannot get mature insulin from this strategy. This was a real problem in the 70s and 80s, and scientists finally came to a solution, which led to the development of humulin, 
the first recombinant human insulin. The protein production is split into two vectors. One vector contains the B chain, the other contains the A chain. You get the templates from the mRNA, make cDNA using primers specific to A chain and B chain, and clone them into your plasmid. To stop translation of B chain, you artificially add stop codons to the B chain reverse primer. A chain is naturally at the end, so a stop codon is already present. Both these templates also get an artificial start codon. There are a few extra things that were engineered into this vector, but the partition of A and B chain is the crux. The A and B chain vector go into separate bacteria. If you think this is weird, note that the mature insulin only has the A and B chains. The C chain and signal peptide is removed, so technically, they are not part of the insulin. From these two bacteria, you independently recover A and B chains. Then you combine the two chains and perform a chemical step called air oxidation. Remember, in bacteria, the oxidative environment of periplasm helps to make disulfide bonds. The air oxidation mimics those conditions. As a result, the A and B chains will come together to form the insulin. Today, the double vector style is replaced with more efficient methods, but it shows that protein expression systems can also be modular. Now, let's move to a human expression host. You want to express the Cas9 enzyme in human cells. The Cas9 is bacteria-derived and not found in humans, so the template needs to be optimized. The vector architecture will look something like this. You need to pick a human-specific promoter, ribosome binding site, and a terminator. Now you can expect to get a Cas9 protein from this vector. By default, the Cas9 would be cytosolic. Our application is genome editing in humans, and the genome is compartmentalized in the nucleus, which means the Cas9 ORF needs a signal, a nuclear localization signal, so the protein is relocated to the nucleus after it is translated. Let's go a step further. What if you also wanted to image or stain Cas9, or maybe do a western blot? You can get an antibody against Cas9, and you're all good. Alternatively, you could also add a small epitope to your protein. We discussed this in the previous video. The beauty here is that you can have antibodies against this custom epitope. And tomorrow, if you decide you don't want to use Cas9, but instead want to switch to Cas12, or any other protein for that matter for any application, you don't have to buy a new antibody for the new protein. Just add the same epitope to all your proteins and use the same antibody again and again. Here's a look at the vector architecture with a flag tag, the epitope, and the nuclear localization signal attached at the end terminus of Cas9. In RNA expression vector video, I discussed the guide RNA production, and now you know how Cas9 protein could be expressed. If you combine these two plasmids in a cell, the Cas9 will find the RNA component to form an active complex for editing. Don't worry about details on this just yet. I have videos on CRISPR coming up soon. Similar to this heterologous expression in human cells, COVID mRNA vaccine that results in spike protein is yet another example of a human-specific protein expression system. COVID mRNA vaccine is not a vector-based system, but the architecture is very similar, with some fancy features. A video on it is linked down in the description in case you're interested. Alright, final example. You want to express a P53 GFP fusion protein in a human cell. P53 is natural to humans, GFP is not, and it needs to be codon optimized. Let's talk about fusion. There are two ways to think about this. Either GFP in the front or GFP in the back. The choice is not trivial. Typically, you want to make sure if this is done already and just use what other people have done if it makes sense. Otherwise, see if a protein folding is biased in any way. Maybe one of the ends is exposed and the other is buried. Or try both ways both front and back, and see which one works best. For this example, say the GFP is to be fused to the C-terminal of the P53. And here's the vector architecture. GFP ORF follows the P53 ORF in one contiguous segment. When combining these two, you make sure to remove the stop codon from P53 to allow the ribosome to continue translation into GFP. And this gets you the two proteins fused together. However, there's a small catch there needs to be something flexible in the middle of the two proteins. It makes sure in a fusion protein both partners have room for movement. 
If the fusion proteins are stacked without flexibility, then both proteins may be non-functional. Generally, a flexible linker is a stretch of repeating glycine and serine residues. People often call it the GS linker. In some odd cases, a rigid linker may be preferred. It depends on your application. The linker typically goes into the ORF, regardless of the fusion orientation. Now, if you fix the architecture, the two protein ORFs are separated by a small linker sequence in the middle. A standard way to add a linker is through primer overhangs. So linkers are good to prevent protein-protein steric hindrance. Here's a snapshot of the template. The promoter here is of viral origin. P53 is in the front, GFP at the end, with the GS linker in the middle. An important thing to notice is that two ORFs are in one single frame, and there is no stop codon at the end of P53. There are many more examples more complex than these, but I hope this gives you some intuition about protein expression vectors. Regardless of how awesome your protein is, you are likely to run into issues. A big issue common to bacterial host is inclusion bodies. These are aggregates of your protein that fail to solubilize or sometimes your protein doesn't even fold properly and then it aggregates. Aggregates often lead to inactive proteins and you could extract protein from inclusion bodies and try to refold the protein later but that doesn't always work and it is inefficient. One solution is to express helper proteins like chaperones to assist in proper folding which means you need to have a second expression system for chaperones. Alternatively, you could lower the growth temperature to decrease metabolism. Sometimes it helps in protein folding. If solubility is a problem, maybe add a solubilization tag. Or cut back on the expression intensity. Sometimes less is more. The wild card scenario is production of toxins. Plants can find some use in toxin production. Toxins are generally expressed as secreted proteins. You can't expect an expression host to live a healthy life when expressing a deadly protein. Or just don't use cells at all. That is an expensive way to make proteins though. This discussion has some caveats, and here's a big one. All examples discussed in this video are vector-based, which means that the expression is temporary. In prokaryotes, the plasmid is an independent replicon with a selection system. If you remove selection bias, the plasmid will eventually be lost after some generations of bacterial division. Since selection is present at some level, we don't worry about plasmids so much in bacteria. However, it is difficult in eukaryotes. Outside of yeast, there aren't any replicants to stably maintain plasmids. In mammalian cells, you expect your vector to last only about a week before it gets destroyed or lost. To make expression permanent, genome-level editing is required to insert or integrate expression constructs into the genome. I will discuss those methods in the upcoming videos.